Good evening. Let's get started. Please take your seats. Welcome to the 10th Annual Symposia Christi at Purdue University. I'm John Canty, your MC for the weekend. I serve an international ministry called Ratio Christi, which is Latin for Reason of Christ. We're present on nearly 200 campuses, and we're dedicated to encouraging and equipping students and faculty with historic, scientific, and philosophical reasons for following Jesus. We welcome nearly 1,000 of you attending here live at Purdue University's Loeb Playhouse, and we welcome the many, many more joining us live stream from universities and locations around the world. We're thankful for over 30 sponsors. These you saw on the screen behind me as you're walking in or waiting for the live stream to start. You can also find them in our literature and on our website at symposiachristi.net. Putting an event on like this is really a team sport, and uh, I'm personally thankful for the members of the symposium executive team representing PCM, Navigators, InterVarsity, Crew, WDA, Campus House, and Covenant Church. At this time, please take out your cell phones and silence them. Don't be that guy or gal. For tweets and hashtags, use hashtag do you matter. We'll have a live Q&A at the end, so please hold your questions till then. Purdue University is consistently ranked one of the best in the world, right? And this is not just because our faculty are top notch in their disciplines, but because they genuinely care about their students. They believe their students matter. <clears throat> Some of these top notch faculty believe that Christianity provides the most reasonable basis for why their students matter. And a few of them are here today, professors who are confessors. Hi, I'm Richard Strohschein. I'm a professor of agricultural engineering here at Purdue. And I want to say just a few words about how students matter. First day of class, I like to introduce myself to the students and I tell them a lot about myself. But one of the things I tell them is when I was in the Navy, the pieces of the puzzle came together for me. But what do I mean by that? Well, I tell them that I decided that there was a God and that he was in control of the universe. Uh, he was active and living and uh, doing things. But then, you know, I realized that there was a barrier between me and God. And the barrier was the sin, my sins, the wrong things that I had done. But then I understood that uh, if I believe and put my faith in Jesus and his work on the cross, um, that his death on the cross paid the price for my sins, and that barrier is removed. So I tell the students that and some other things about myself, and then I invite them to send me an email and tell me something about them, themselves. And then during the semester, I pray for my students by name and some of the things that I pray for them. Oh, I should add that uh, when I made that decision, when I put my faith in Jesus, that has added meaning and purpose to my life. And I do tell my students that also. But uh, I tell them, uh, or I pray for them, okay, by name. And I, one of the things I pray is that they'll learn some good things from my class. They'll develop their talents and their skills. I also pray that God would bless their futures, uh, that he would guide and lead them. And I pray that they would make good decisions. In John chapter 10, the Gospel of John chapter 10 and verses 10 and 11, Jesus is quoted. And Jesus draws a contrast. And he said, he says, <clears throat> the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd, but a good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So one of the things I also pray for my students is they'll follow the shepherd and not be victims of the thief. Good evening. My name is Dulcie Abraham, and I'm a professor of civil engineering in the Lyle School of Civil Engineering at Purdue. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. 
And I have great pride that I'm the child of God. I'm made in the image of God, and I'm so treasured and valued and loved by him. I believe that Jesus Christ is the author of my life and that he has redeemed me because of his death on the cross and because of his resurrection. I believe that the Bible and a Christian worldview gives me ample evidence that I can trust in Jesus. I can rely on his promises. You know, I'm very, very blessed. God has brought me to this wonderful place of learning called Purdue University. I feel that he has placed me at Purdue as his ambassador because I matter to him and I, you, know, he, you know, he takes every one of us, all my students, my colleagues, and each one of them matter to him as well. And because I am blessed to be at Purdue, I feel that I have the privilege to serve Jesus, my master and my Lord, through the work that I do, and also through the interactions that I have with my students and my colleagues. I think it's a privilege to pray with my students and for my students, a privilege to be concerned about my colleagues and to pray and uh, mentor them. So I hope that you will uh, explore the claims that Jesus has made and see whether you can also have that gift of being loved and being cherished and knowing that you matter in his sight. Thank you. Hi, I'm John Peterson. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Mathematics here at Purdue University. And mathematicians are often fond of talking about the beauty of mathematics. But if mathematics is beautiful, that sort of begs the question, where does this beauty come from? And as a Christian, I believe that this beauty comes from God, who gave us the language of mathematics so that we can understand his creation. And as Kepler said, think God's thoughts after him. My name is Erica Carlson, and I'm a professor of physics and astronomy. And as a scientist, it's my great privilege to use the scientific method in order to uncover truth. And as I do that, as I learn more about the universe, I learn more and more about the one who created it. I see in the record of nature that he is kind, that he is brilliant, way smarter than any physics professor I've ever met, that he is wonderfully creative, and that he loves you. It's also my great privilege as a professor to teach students how to find truth. And one of the best things about that is that I know as they learn truth, it draws them closer to the one who said, I am the truth, and that's Jesus Christ. Hello, everyone. My name is Dan Dawson. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Earth, Atmospheric, and Planetary Sciences here at Purdue. And I'm a follower of Jesus. I just happen to be a follower of Jesus who likes to teach, study, and sometimes even chase severe storms and tornadoes. Uh, every time, every day I get to do my job, I count it an immense privilege to be able to witness and, and learn a little bit more about God's creation. It's incredibly awe-inspiring, these uh, phenomena that we have to deal with. But also, it's important because people matter. And there's a lot of people who um, are hurt every year or killed by tornadoes and severe storms. And so if my research can help in a little way to ease that suffering, then I count that also as an immense privilege. Thank you. Good evening. I am Linda Wallace, Dean Emerita of the Indiana University Kokomo School of Nursing. Yes, I'm the one here in red. <laughs> Thank you for inviting me. More importantly, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. I constantly remind my nursing students that we walk on the holy ground of real people's lives. Why is it holy ground? It's holy ground because before the world was made, God knew we would be here that he fearfully and wonderfully made each and every one of us, that he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. That gives us significance. 
because God would not send his only son to die on the cross for people who are insignificant. Every day as a nurse, I get to get the opportunity to um, find out and meet people's needs, but they're needs that Jesus lets me know about. And what we have to offer is Jesus' love. We extend Jesus' love um, to people when they're at, in their greatest need and they're, when they're at the most happy, also before life and until death. So whatever your calling is, your specific calling, whether it's nursing or engineering or construction or whatever your specific calling is, God has a purpose for you. You are significant. And God promises whatever we give him, he will take and use. God is faithful. Thank you. Hi, my name is John Umbeck. I'm professor of economics at Purdue and the director of the Purdue University Research Center in Economics. I, as a researcher, I'm always interested in finding data to support my theories. So 31 years ago, before I was a Christian, if you had asked me, am I a believer, I would have told you, I'm an atheist, thank God. <laughs> and then one day, a friend of mine showed me a passage in the New Testament where Jesus said, those who seek will find, and those who knock, the door will be opened. And I thought, hey, I can do that. And I knocked. And I must have mattered because God opened the door. I'm here tonight, and I'm a believer. Thank you. Using a secret, using a secret room in their house, Corey Ten Boom's family helped some 800 Jews escape the Nazi Holocaust during World War II. While this required Corey to lie to Nazi soldiers, her actions are seen by most as noble and good. But wait, is it good to lie? Does lying become good if it saves lives? On what basis can such moral dilemmas be decided? Do the ends justify the means? Or is saving lives just inherently more important than telling the truth? Or maybe there is no such thing as a moral dilemma, and it's just wrong to lie no matter what. Maybe you and I don't face moral dilemmas of this magnitude every day. But we do find ourselves often seeking the greater of two goods, or the lesser of two evils. Some of you might be thinking about a recent presidential election. So how do you make moral choices, and why? The purpose of these symposiums is to explore some of the most probing questions about faith, reason, and life. To challenge worldviews and foundational beliefs with reason, evidence, and love. We hope that through the talks this weekend and subsequent conversations about these topics, that we will all be encouraged to think more clearly and more deeply about the foundations upon which we build our lives. The theme this year is, do you matter? And the keynote address will explore whether naturalism or Christianity can provide a more reasonable answer to this question. Our keynote speaker, Dr. Scott Ray, is Dean of the Faculty and Professor of Christian Ethics at Talbot School of Theology, Biola University. He has a bachelor's in economics from Southern Methodist University, a master's in theology from uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, and a PhD in social ethics from the University of Southern California. He is currently a consultant for ethics at four Southern California hospitals. He is a fellow of the Center of Bioethics and Human Dignity, and a fellow for the Wilberforce Forum. He has recently served as the president for the Evangelical Theological Society. Dr. Ray has authored more than a dozen books on ethics, including the textbook, Moral Choices, which comes out in its fourth edition this summer. Doctor, please join me in welcome, Dr. Scott Ray. Thank you.
Well, good evening. Oh, that's really loud, isn't it? I don't, wow. I think I'll save my boom. I think I'll use my indoor voice here. Good evening. Thank you for uh, being here with us. I'm delighted to have a chance to be with you. Uh, I have come all the way from Southern California, so I'm freezing my tail off out here, I got to tell you. Uh, I came, when I left Southern California on Wednesday, it was 89 degrees. I'm not, I'm not, I, I just, I was telling some of these folks that I was with, I don't, I don't I actually have clothes for the weather here. So uh, I'm grateful that uh, we've been able to stay indoors. I'm not a totally wimpy Californian, though, so I have been outside some. Um, and un unlike, uh, you know, well, unlike California, when I, I've, I had to remind myself when the sun comes out here in the winter, it's not necessarily warming up. That, mean, that means it's really cold. Uh, so I, that, that's a little bit deceptive. So I am del just delighted to be here with you. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Uh, it's the first of three talks that I'll be giving uh, on, on different areas around the subject, Do You Matter? We'll address that subject directly tonight. Then the two I'll talk about tomorrow at the plenary sessions tomorrow will be uh, Does Sex Matter?, which is getting into areas of biotechnology, reproductive technology, and the future of reproduction and procreation. Um, and then uh, in the afternoon, I'll address uh, the issue, does, does your work matter? Uh, and talk about the whole issue of calling and vocation and sort of what that, what that says to, especially to university students who are headed out into an increasingly challenging workplace today. So I want to start uh, tonight with the, uh, the keynote address to this and, and, and really ask, ask and answer the qu two different questions that are up on the screen. Do you matter? And I think the more important question is, says who? And on what basis or why? Now, I guess my guess is that most of us have some sort of intuitive sense that we matter. But once we get into harder questions about where that comes from, where that's grounded, and how reliable is that grounding, that's where our more difficult questions come in. So let me, let me suggest that uh, Stanford philosopher John Cyril has set this up, I think, particularly nicely. He said there's exactly one overriding question in contemporary philosophy. How do we fit in? How can we square this conception of ourselves, our intuitive notion, as mindful, meaning-creating, free, rational, and I would add to this, moral agents, with a universe that in his, in his worldview consists entirely of mindless, meaningless, unfree, non-rational, brute, physical particles? Now, Catholic philosopher Jacques Maritain I think, sharpened the question for us like this. He was a contributor to the UN Declaration on Human Rights that was, that was articulated back in the, in the late 1940s after World War II and the horrors of the Holocaust. And part of that declaration put it like this, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation happened to my screen here? I will go on. The screen will come back in just a minute. Uh, what's that? Oh, it is here. It's just not on my screen. It's okay. So I'll have to, I'll have to turn around like this. Uh, <laughs> oh. For those of you who are live streaming, hang in there with us for a minute. I'm not exactly sure why that happened. And now I'm supposed to join AT&T, which I don't want to do. I don't want to do any of those things. I don't want to, I don't want to report it. What's that? N uh, in the bag. Gosh, I was just getting to a great point, too. <laughs> Here, okay, here we go. 
I knew I was going to need help from the physicist here eventually. All right. Maritan put it like, like this. In the, in, the, in the Declaration, there's a recognition of the inherent dignity and of equal and inalienable rights. Go, no. Look, what a magic touch, I'm telling you. <laughs> Let me suggest, I would not want to get on your bad side. So, um, all right, Maritain put it, he put it like this, we agree on all of these rights. And I think, that's, I, think that's, I think that is still true today. We agree on fundamental human rights, provided we are not asked why. With the why, the dispute begins. In other words, I think most of us would acknowledge that we matter, but it's the says who question where we begin to have lots of disagreements and lots of discussion. Let me suggest that uh, the, I think the, in our culture today, and particularly in academic culture, the predominant way of, of viewing the world, the predominant lenses through which we view the world is what we call naturalism or physicalism. And the point here, I think philosopher Paul Churchland puts it like this. He said, the important point about the standard evolutionary story is that the human species and all of its features are the wholly physical outcome of a purely physical process which, by the way, is a, is, a, is a philosophical declaration, not a scientific one. If this is the correct account of our origins, then there seems neither, no, nah, come on, don't do that. Then there seems neither need nor room to fit any non-physical substances or properties into our theoretical account of ourselves. We are creatures of matter. And he would say matter alone. And we should learn to live with that fact. Now, it seems to me in contemporary philosophy today and in much of the sciences, this is, this is the common view of a human being. That is, that human beings are nothing more than physical objects reducible to their molecules and chemical reactions that function according to the laws of chemistry and physics. Now, the the question, in light of that view of the world, how do human beings fit in? Back to John Cyril's question at the, at the very beginning. I see there, there are, in general, three answers that are most commonly provided to this question of do we matter, how do we fit in? The first one of these is, in essence, we don't, and get over it. Like starting now, get over it. A second one is to suggest we do, but it's based largely on, on an evolutionary explanation for human significance. A third common response to this is that we do, and it's conferred, that our, our, our purpose and significance is conferred either by government or by some sort of social practice or we, or we might call it, it is self-conferred. We, we decide that we are meaningful and purposeful and what that shape that takes. Okay? So, so either government-conferred, socially-conferred, or self-conferred. Now, I think perhaps the clearest denial of human significance, this first response, that we don't fit in, we don't matter, and get over it, comes from the Princeton bioethicist Peter Singer, who has popularized the term speciesism, that is being a racist for your species, to describe the view that, that human beings have any special significance vis-a-vis -vis the animal world, not to mention the rest of creation. Singer rejects the notion that mere membership in the human species endows human beings with any special significance. He first used this term way long ago in his work on animal rights back in the 1970s. Now, Singer, although in interestingly, and this is not generally a matter of public record, uh, Singer ha admittedly had great difficulty applying his own view of a human being when it came to taking care of his own very seriously ill mother. In fact, I had a chance to moderate a debate between Singer and a 
a Christian bioethicist years ago in which it was, it, he made it very clear at the, at the start of the debate that his treatment of his mother was considered to be off the table for any, any of the debate and the discussion, which suggests that even the, the ardent deniers of significance for human beings have, have difficulty in what I would call biting the bullet with the full implications of that view. Similarly, philosopher James Rachels outlined in his, how, in his view, Darwinism has undermined the notions of human dignity and the sacredness of human life. He clearly rejects the idea that human beings have any special significance, particularly in virtue of their membership in the human species. He puts it like this in the introduction to his work. I shall argue that Darwin's theory undermines the traditional ideas that human life has special, unique worth. These echo the comments of the, 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 the scientist Richard Dawkins in the UK, who argued that the natural universe consisting of, quote, just electrons and selfish genes has precisely the properties we would expect if, it, if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil or good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Now, interestingly, like Singer, Dawkins refers to the ideas of human purpose and significance as mere illusions. Yet, interestingly, also publicly admits to being a passionate, quote, passionate anti-Darwinian when it comes to politics and how we should conduct our human affairs. Again, perhaps reflecting an uneasiness with biting the bullet on the full implications of naturalism and physicalism. Now, instead of an outright denial of human significance, others attempt to account for, to recognize significance in some way that's consistent with an evolutionary framework for human origins. One example of this comes from the work of the political philosopher Ronald Dworkin, who argues that the significance of human life is grounded in the process of natural and human creation. He grounds this in both the process of naturalistic evolution, which is evolution without any, any design or designer, and the human contribution to making someone's life what it is. He suggests that human beings are, quote, creative masterpieces that are the result of natural creation, self-creation, and re-creation. Okay? Though it's not, to be, to be honest, it's not exactly clear to me what the precise difference is between all of those things. He articulates it like this when he says that the life of a single human organism commands respect because of the complex creative investment it represents and because of our wonder at the process that produced new lives from old ones, the processes of national and community and language through which a human being will come to absorb and continue hundreds of cultures and forms of life and value, and finally when mental life has begun and flourishes. The horror we feel at the willful destruction of human life reflects our shared sense of the intrinsic importance of each of these dimensions of that investment. Now, what Dworkin seems to be arguing here is both substantial natural and human investment, quote, in the person who becomes, who each person becomes, grounds our view of human significance and thus human rights. That is, human significance is recognized in view of the complex natural and human processes that produce human beings for what they are. In other words, it's, it's, it's by virtue of the universe's investment in human beings that we see through the process of long, long millennia of evolution. Now, rather than denying human significance altogether or grounding it in some aspect of evolutionary adaptation, some insist that human significance is conferred. It's neither denied nor recognized, but granted through social practices of treating human beings with dignity and respect. For example, the philosopher Richard Rorty put it like this. He said, there is no human nature for human rights to be grounded in. 
it is only the social practice of according certain rights to each and every human being that attaches rights to the status of being human. Now, human rights, as Rorty sees it, are all socially conferred. They are all social constructions. None of them is natural in any sense. Now, of course, the, a big part of the history of, 20, of the 20th century is the story of what happened when those rights were unconferred. And what's often failed, we fail to recognize is that it is it, just as easily as rights can be conferred, they can be disconferred just as easily. And the story of the incredibly bloody 20th century and the, the, the administrations of various tyrants around the world and their outright denial of human rights suggests what happens when those human rights get unconferred. Now, to be a little more specific, an example of how human significance is conferred actually comes out of the discussion on abortion, particularly that of the personhood of the fetus. For example, bioethicist Hilde Lindemann describes a social practice of a pregnant woman calling her fetus into personhood and suggest that this bestowal of personhood by the mother is the foundational social practice by which the fetus is conferred with significance. In other words, the process by which the mother chooses to continue the pregnancy is one of the primary social practices. Now, there are a host of others that she describes, but it's one of the primary social practices which actually confer meaning and significance onto the fetus that she is carrying. She describes it this way. She says, but describe the pregnancy in purely physical terms fails to capture the central role the woman is playing in the profoundly social activity of calling her fetus into personhood, making a place in the social world for the developing child to occupy when it is born. By the phrase, calling a fetus into personhood, I don't mean giving birth or giving biological life. I view personhood as a social practice. Now, I think probably she would not say that that's a a metaphysical or an ontological category, as she calls it the most fundamental social practice on which all other practices rest. Now, she, she said it's not only the mother who's involved calling this child into personhood. Lindemann refers to this as a social process that involves other family members, others close to the mother, in addition to a variety of accepted social practices, norms, and expectations that all serve to reinforce the mother's primary foundational call of the fetus into personhood. I would say the significance of the fetus is not recognized, per se. It's not something that it doesn't ontologically exist and has to be recognized or discovered or discerned, it is actually conferred uh, almost as though the mother confers a, a blessing on a bl- blessing of personhood onto the child as she and others throughout the process by which the child is given birth and brought into the world uh, call that fetus into personhood. Okay. Now, let me, let, me, let me make the same application that I did just a moment ago to this particular example of conferring personhood. As, as, we, as we know, just by, by virtue of the number of abortions that are done every year, there are lots of children for whom personhood is not conferred on them. Uh, the so, these social practices don't take place. The mother chooses not to have the child, which is her right under the law. But I'd say for, for the child, for the fetus, there is, if, if, the, if those social practices do not take place, and if personhood is not conferred, then that fetus has, has virtually nothing on which to rest any kind of claim to have any rights whatsoever. And in fact, I think probably you could probably extend that argument 
a bit further. Um, and that since, since this conferral of personhood is not a specific metaphysical or ontological category, there's probably, not, there's probably not much ontological difference between a fetus in the womb and a child after he or she has been born. Now, I think the other, the other way in which significance can be conferred, and is a very powerful one in our culture today, is when it is self-conferred. Where more and more people, particularly in our, what I would call a, a, a radical individualist culture that exists in the West, this idea I think would be actually quite foreign in other parts of the world, that a one's purpose could be actually self-conferred with the subjectivism that that implies. Other parts of the world, other cultures, particularly in Asia and Africa and other parts of the world that are much more communally oriented, I think would find this a very strange notion uh, that your, your purpose and significance could be entirely an individual matter of, of being individually conferred. But let's, we'll, we'll take this just in, we'll take the, the, the cultural critique of that aside. That's, that's a much bigger subject and beyond what we have time for this evening. But if we just take, as it's, as it's often applied in the West, where I am responsible for my own sense of significance, I am responsible for creating my own sense of meaning and purpose in the world, I am charting my own path, regardless of what anybody else says about this. Think about how quickly that collapses into subjectivism. Right? Now, I think we, we, you know, we, I think we have no, we have no issue with people who, who we say we want them to own their own sense of meaning and significance. And we want them to chart their own path. We want them to take responsibility for that. But in terms of the ultimate sense of significance and meaning, that that collapse into subjectivity is really damaging. Take, take, for example, the person whose goal in life, and they've thought it through, their, their goal in life is to be the most effective administrator of torture on the planet. Or take the person who says, uh, my goal in life is to have the largest drug distribution operation in the world to challenge the cartels. Or the person who says, uh, my, my goal in life is to have the, the, the most global human trafficking operation in the world. Now, what would we say about that kind of conferred, self-conferred significance? I think most of us would say, you know, there's something not quite right with that picture. That we, we, have, we would have some sort of objective limits on what kind of significance a person could self-confer, which suggests, it seems to me, that the, whole, the, the project of the self-conferral of significance and, and worth and matter and purpose is one that's flawed right from the start. And it, needs, and it seems to me that where, where this conferred significance runs aground is in its deliberate neglect of ontological and metaphysical categories for assigning and recognizing, we would say recognizing, human significance. Now, let me, let me go back just a little bit. Now, let me suggest some things uh, on, on a strictly naturalistic basis that if, if, all, all that, if all that exists is matter and the laws of chemistry and physics and what we can empirically verify, accounting for some of the things that we commonly hold make human beings significant, I think we'll find is pretty challenging. So I want to I think about some of those things for just a couple minutes here. For example, take rationality among the aspects that are, are widely held, not universally, but I think widely held, to separate human beings from the rest of the natural world, and thus to help us account for some of the significance of human beings, are both rationality and morality and moral properties. Okay. Now, what I want to suggest is that Accounting for these on a naturalistic basis faces some pretty significant philosophical challenges. And at the end, well, I'll come to this at the end, 
but I'll sort of give you a preview of where, where, the end, where we're going at the end on this, is that Christian theism provides a much more comfortable home for these concepts of rationality and morality. Now, account, the, the phenomena of rationality on strictly naturalistic grounds presents I mean, some significant issues that have to be accounted for. Though it seems clear that a rudimentary ability for reasoning would be necessary for adaptive success in an evolutionary framework, it's much harder to explain the origin and history of abstract rationality, theoretical physics, for example, on strictly naturalistic grounds. Notre Dame philosopher Alvin Plantinga puts it this way, where he, he suggests that the purpose of our cognitive faculties from an evolutionary perspective is to contribute to our reproductive fitness, to contribute to our survival and reproduction. Current physics, with its ubiquitous partial differential equations, not to mention relativ relativity theory with its tensors, quasi-mechanics, non-abelian non group theory, current set theory with all its daunting complexities, you get all of that, uh, involves mathematics of great depth, mathematicians in here I think will appreciate that, requiring cognitive powers going enormously beyond what is required for survival and reproduction. In fact, planting a, with tongue thoroughly planted in cheek goes on to suggest that some, some as such abstract reasoning may have actually been a detriment to survival due to what he called, it's his words, not mine, the nerdiness factor, where the only ones who found this kind of reasoning helpful for survival are professors concerned with achieving tenure. Sorry, I had, had to just, I had to take a shot there. Uh, now, I, not only is it difficult, I think, to account for abstract reasoning, it's not even clear that evolutionary adaptability requires beliefs to be formed in the first place, nor for those beliefs to be necessarily true. Take first the issue that beliefs are necessary to be formed for adaptive behavior to occur. Plantinga distinguishes between what he calls indicators, that is the neural structures that take in data from the environment that cause beha behaviors to enable the organism to engage in the necessary parts of life to survive, such as fleeing, fighting, reproducing, so on. Planting a slice, the, the example of tiny bacteria, which have indicators that are connected to its propulsion mechanism that enable it to move forward toward waters in which it can survive. But those mechanisms do not require beliefs to be formed about those indicators. Planting a puts it this way. Fleeing predators, finding food and mates, these things require cognitive devices that in some way track crucial features of the environment and are appropriately connected with muscles. But they do not require true belief or even belief at all. Indicators need not be or involve beliefs. The objector is right in pointing out that fitness requires adequate, accurate indication but nothing follows about the reliability of belief. Now, nor, if you think about it, nor does adaptive behavior require beliefs to be true. One can imagine all sorts of false beliefs that nonetheless could have very significant adaptive value. Okay? Consider, for example, the early human being who is face to face with a dangerous predator. Assuming he, could, he or she could hold beliefs, there's no reason to think that those beliefs must be true in order to produce the right adaptive behavior. He or she could believe any number of things that are false and still produce a response of flight from the predator. For example, the person could believe that the predator is friendly but the best way to show friendship toward the predator would be, would be to sing loudly to it from a great distance. Right? I, I, I'd pay to see that, actually. Or the person could believe that if they get close to the predator, they will be eaten. Both beliefs cause the same behavior, that of flight from the predator, 
In fact, whether they are true or not is irrelevant to producing the behavior necessary to survive. But I don't know about you, that sounds counterintuitive to me. Wouldn't we say generally that true beliefs produce adaptive behavior and false ones do not? I think in general that seems intuitive. It is true that we generally trust our rational faculties. Amen? That's true. I think it's true. According to beliefs that are true. Now, I've been around some people who I'm not quite sure I trust their total, their, completely trust their rational faculties, but those people will go unnamed since we're live streaming and they might be listening. The point here is that in a world with a naturalistic framework, there is no reason to presume that our rational faculties are necessarily reliable. We generally hold that true beliefs cause beneficial actions by virtue of the content of those beliefs. But if naturalism is true, then belief is simply a neural structure that has neurophysical properties that cause the appropriate behavior. And the content of the belief is irrelevant to producing the behavior. A belief can actually have the same neurophysical properties that cause the same behaviors and a variety of different contents of that belief. Now, let me, let's shift gears a bit, and let me say a little bit about accounting for morality and moral properties in a naturalistic world. Now, on a strictly naturalistic basis, uh, morality can be seen as the product of evolutionary development. For example, Sociobiologist E.O. Wilson insists that ethical codes have arisen by evolution through the interplay of biology and culture. He cites parallels in behavior between animals and human beings. He claims they originated similarly and concludes that, quote, ought is the product of a material process. Similarly, Philosopher Michael Ruse puts it this way, the position of the modern evolutionist is that human beings have an awareness of morality because such an awareness is of biological worth. Morality is a biological adaptation no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, Ethics is illusory. And he goes on to say, I appreciate that when somebody says, love your neighbor as yourself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. As he puts it, morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction. Any deeper meaning is illusory. The view here is that moral behavior, particularly in the group, is advantageous to survival. Traits such as cooperation, respect, civility, toleration are deemed to make it easier to get along and survive, particularly in large groups. So I think some of the things going on in our culture are testing that thesis significantly at present. Now, think, think about the, the moral values that we widely accept as universal that don't seem to have any particular adaptive value. Think about values such as altruism and self-sacrifice, especially the kind of sacrifice that societies have held up for a long time as heroic, such as giving up one's life for another. In the evolutionary scheme of things, that person is a loser right? Because they don't, they don't pass along their genes to the next generation. Compassion, forgiveness, unconditional love can all be seen as putting both individuals and communities at competitive disadvantage when it comes to survival and reproduction. In fact, I would argue that many, if not most, 
of our moral obligations call for an explicit setting aside of one's self-interest in order to adhere to moral values that have intrinsic value apart from any advantage gained for the individual or community. Now think about that. If the ethical egoist is right and that all morality is reducible to self-interest, all, all, every one of your ethics classes would be canceled. Okay? Now, some of you might say, you know, glory for that day. Uh, but when I tell my, for example, I tell my students in business ethics, if, if ethical behavior was always profitable in business, everybody would always do it. If ethical behavior was always in your self-interest, nobody would cut corners about anything, Right? And we wouldn't, we wouldn't be having a lot of the moral discussions that we would have. The reality is, at least in the short term, ethical behavior is almost always costly to the person. That's why we have things like ethical dilemmas in the first place, because there's almost always a short-term cost to adhering to values or principles or virtues that we claim to be are intrinsically valuable. Now, I would suggest the difficulty here in with, when we talk about morality actually goes a little deeper. As with rationality, the mechanism of adaptability on an evolutionary scheme has little to do with whether our moral evaluations are true or not. Now, for example, uh, philosopher Thomas Nagel takes the examples of pain and pleasure and recognizes that the association of pain with injury and pleasure with sex, for example, both have important adaptive values. However, the evaluative notion of pain as morally bad and pleasure as morally good are both irrelevant to the adaptive value of those phenomena. That is, aversion to pain has value sur for survival without any regard for, to any moral assessment that pain is a bad thing. Nagel puts it this way. I love how he puts this. The mind-independent truth of moral judgments has no role to play in the Darwinian story. So far as natural selection is concerned, if there were such a thing as mind-independent moral truth, those judgments could be systematically false. Now, Nagel, I think, rightly distinguishes between factual judgments, which are essential for the perception necessary to adapt and survive, and value judgments, which he holds are irrelevant. He puts it this way, a Darwinian account of the origin of our basic desires and aversions has no implications as to whether they are generally reliable perceptions of judgment-independent value or whether there indeed even is such a thing. They can actually even produce moral conclusions grounded in reproductive advantage that I would consider, I would suggest most of us consider heinous today. Take, for example, the authors of the book A Natural History of Rape. Now, you heard that correctly. A Natural History of Rape where they argue that sexual assault can be explained in reproductive terms. Now, to be fair, the authors do not suggest that sexual assault is, is moral, okay? though the basis on which they make that assessment is far from clear. They put it this way, out of a desire to reproduce and lacking the availability of a mate, this results in the drive to force oneself onto someone with whom they can reproduce. Now, of course, they do not condone this behavior, but it's not clear on, the, on which basis they claim it's immoral and ought to be prohibited if the impulse to engage in such behavior is actually rooted in biological advantage. This makes the grounding in biological advantage conducive to survival, but not necessarily conducive to truth, similar to rationality. By extension of this, British philosopher Richard Swinburne suggests that on a naturalistic basis, we should expect nothing more than what he calls the term, he used the term wantons. 
Swinburne uses this term to describe individuals who have no notion of duty but only act to satisfy his or her own desires. Sound culturally familiar? If naturalism, according to Swinburne, cannot produce any adequately granted moral properties, then we are left with a world full of wantons. Now, if it's true that the satisfaction of desires attains that, you know, that high a value in an adaptive view of the world, then that, that presents actually some very troubling conclusions. For one, probably good that my wife is not listening to the live stream on this, but if the satisfaction of my own desires was, was the primary moral principle, I would certainly be polygamous, right? Don't, don't look at me like that. You, you know I'm not being weird to say that. I, because if, 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 if the satisfaction of my desires is, really, is, is, is either all that matters or one of the primary things that matter in our moral assessments and adaptive value, then, I, then monogamy is an incredibly counterintuitive concept. Uh, now, I, I, I take it, let me take it a little bit further. It seems to me that naturalism fails to account for the full texture of a moral universe that's part of the normal experience of human beings. We live in a world where we experience moral obligations and judgments when we fail to live up to them. In fact, I would argue that in our culture today, we, we are not nearly as relativistic as I think we used to be. In fact, I think there's actually a new absolutism that is reigning in culturally around, around certain ideas and practices and ideologies. And, it, and I think, especially on college campuses, I think we were seeing a very, very much a new absolutism about certain moral actions, uh, particularly those regarding race, gender, sexuality, and diversity. Now, further, it seems to me, we experience lots of different moral obligations which result in net losses of benefit to those who keep those obligations. For example, the obligation to rescue someone in need, repay a debt, keep a promise, refrain from stealing. In fact, I think you can make a good argument that most of our moral obligations involve these kinds of things. That is, you would have a moral obligation that could not provide any sense of good or benefit but only losses to the person with that obligation. Yet, we would still have those obligations, and if the person fails to keep them, he or she would be subject to judgment, in some cases even shame, and the greater the failure, the greater the sense that the person is somehow defective in character. Right? And I tell my, for example, we tell our business students that, you know, you know don't, don't think that character doesn't matter in the workplaces that you go into, because though the companies you go to work for may not, it's probably not quite to say that they're in the character formation business, they are certainly in the character screening business. And that, the, the character of the people who work for most of the companies that you, will go, that you all will go to work for matters enormously to them. Uh, and I think will continue to matter in the years to come. Now, it seems to me these obligations, I put it like this, these obligations only make sense if unless, if unless reality is somehow committed to morality in a very deep way. Only if there's a moral demand on the world, and only if reality will satisfy that demand. The radical demands of morality that most often bring losses to a person's life when, when viewed from a naturalist, physicalist view of the world, in many cases just seem overtly absurd. Let me, let me reflect a bit on human significance in a distinctly Christian view of the world. I said at the very beginning that I thought we could make a good argument that, that the answer to the questions, do you matter, and says who, and do we fit, are much more at home in a distinctly Christian view of the world, which I'm going to call Judeo-Christian theism. For the theist, I think both, both for Judaism and Christianity, 
you matter, ultimately, as, as several of the faculty members mentioned, because ultimately, at the end of the day, you are made in, his, in the image of God as His representative in the world with intrinsic and inestimable value. Human rights seems to me apart from a theistic foundation are on very shaky ground. It seems to me that today we are living on what I would call borrowed capital in terms of our our morality. We are living on capital that is borrowed, I think, from a Judeo-Christian view of the world, uh, which was a consensus 100 years ago but in terms of metaphysics and epistemology, no longer is. But we have, we have been very reluctant as a culture to follow that in terms of its, more, of its morality. I, I love the way, the way Os Guinness puts this. In the West, he, we are living in what he calls cut flower civilizations, in which we expect the flowers to bloom even though they've been cut off from their roots. And I think he, he raises a very interesting question today. One of the major questions that I think as a culture we face is, will, will we in the West sever or recover those roots? Human rights, especially as conferred by government, by groups, by individuals, can just as easily be, be unconferred or disconferred and are, are, do not exist on a secure basis. In a Christian view, worldview, you matter because you are made in the image of God. Your inherent worth is not something that you have to earn. It's, a, it's, what, we, it's what we call, philosophers call an endowment. It is bestowed. And I think our founding fathers actually recognized this when, when they wrote the Declaration of Independence, that they, these, these rights the, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are endowed by our Creator as inalienable rights, which means they cannot be forfeited or taken away without due process of law. Uh, and I think that is a recognition of what uh, in the Catholic tradition we call natural law. I go a little bit further. You, you are significant because you are made by a rational God who has endowed you with rational properties. And he expects you to use them, okay? which is why you're here in a university, ultimately. It's not to get a job, though that matters. It's not to sort of have a safe place to, you know, sort of enter adulthood. Uh, it's ultimately because a rational God has put you here to maximize your rational capacities. He expects you to use them. There are things that are true about which we have not. I so appreciate uh, at least your, your word as a physicist, where you, you, get, you explore what is true. And there are, there are things, in a Christian worldview, there are things that are true. Now, what I want to be careful of is the notion that the only thing that counts for truth is that which is empirically verifiable. Right? That, I think, is the, is the temptation of science, scientism. Now, think about the very, the very sentence I just said that all truth is, that, is only that which is empirically verifiable, that statement itself is not empirically verifiable. And so it seems to me that the, the, the empiricist sort of fails the, the test of their own verification. Um, but I'd want to be, be really careful that we don't get into a false dichotomy where we view knowledge as only a result of science or its subjective. There are, other, there are other things that can be known. I think, you know, philosophers, I think, might actually have something to say about where they fit in that dichotomy. Um, but that's, I think, a false dichotomy. There are other things that can be known and count for knowledge besides those things that are just empirically verifiable. Now, finally, you've been made by a moral God with, with a moral sense and who has embedded moral properties and moral values into the world. Now, let's be clear about this. Moral disagreement is real, and there are lots of controversial issues about which we disagree, and some of those disagreements are very deep. And I'm, frankly, I'm not optimistic about our ability to resolve some of these. We've been working on some of these for a really long time, and we're no closer as a culture to resolving some of our really deep moral disagreements. 
But I'd want to put that in perspective with what I think is a fairly, still fairly deep reservoir of shared values that exists culturally today and that has been shared widely throughout the history of civilization. Otherwise, if, 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 the, if the pool were, were really shallow of those shared values, our life would resemble chaos, it seems to me. But it seems to me we, we actually agree on a lot of things that have moral implications that enable us to live our lives in a peaceable, orderly way together. Even, even something as simple and straightforward as traffic laws have moral overtones on which we basically all agree, right? I mean, the, the moral overtones are that they presume respect for life and property, Right? Because if we assume that somebody's driving down the freeway on the wrong side of the road, assuming they're not inebriated, uh, we, we assume that if you, are, if you are driving with blatant disrespect for traffic laws, you have concern for neither life nor property. Uh, and think about, think about all of the transactions, the financial transactions that take place every day that are premised on trust. It's billions of them every single day. I, w I would not use my credit card if I didn't trust that my information was not going to be abused. One of my favorite students came to Talbot years ago from Ethiopia, and he had never, he, he had never, been, in a, he'd never been really outside of the village that he grew up in. And so the first, first day or two he was on our campus, I took him out for lunch. And when, when the bill came... I handed the server my credit card, and he, he literally he said, what's that? He'd never seen a credit card before. And I can't, I can't imagine what was going through his mind. As the, the server brought the bill back, I signed it and indicated a tip, and I signed it, and then we got up to leave. I think probably what he was thinking is, this is my, I'm, I'm on campus in this philosophy program, and it's second day, and my ethics professor has just stolen our lunch. But he, I mean, literally, he had never seen a credit transaction before. And he said this, I mean, in, in the culture where, where, I, where I come from, he said, this would never happen. In fact, he said routinely the way transactions took place was that the, the seller would have one hand on the product to be sold, and the buyer would have one hand on the money, and they would both release them at the same time. Because nobody trusted anybody at more than just an arm's length. And so I, I used the opportunity to give just a, just a slight, here's the, the economists here will appreciate this, a, a, just a short lesson in political economy and how important trust among strangers is for a thriving, flourishing economy. Uh, and he, but he'd never seen that. I mean, Adam Smith, for example, uh, the, the founder of democratic capitalism presumed that there was a fairly high degree of trust and virtue among the participants if our economic system was to flourish. Our founders of democracy assumed the same thing. Alexis de Tocqueville made it very clear that democracy was not designed for an unvirtuous people. And that assumed, it assumed a fairly deep reservoir of shared moral values that in the early beginnings of the United States and other countries came from its rich Judeo-Christian moral tradition. So to put it, I guess to, to summarize, I put it like this, that in the words of the atheist naturalist philosopher J.L. Mackey, he concludes that moral properties constitute so odd a cluster of properties and relations that they are most unlikely to have arisen in the ordinary course of events without an all-powerful God to create them. And the good news of the gospel message of Jesus Christ is that all-powerful God who made you in His image, who created you with rationality and a moral sense, and who loves you so much that He sent His Son to die on the cross to take your place, to bear the penalty for your sin, so that simply by receiving that gracious gift, you could enter into a relationship with Him where, e where eternal life actually begins now in, in the here and now. And that's, you know, that's ultimately, at the end of the day, the ultimate 
demonstration of why you matter. And it's not only that God says that you matter by virtue of creating you in His image. He demonstrated it in that while, as Paul puts it in Romans 5, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So that's, that's the good news that we want to end with tonight. Um, and so we'll open it for questions here. I think, we've, I think we've got plenty of time for some discussion, and I'll look forward to uh, hearing some of your comments and questions. So we're going to go ahead and start our formal time of Q&A here. Uh, we have a microphone on each side on the end aisles. Go ahead and start lining up. We'll go back and forth between them. And we'll, want, we'll want to get to as many of you as possible. So please speak clearly and concisely and limit yourself to just one question. Oh, you're such a buzzkill about know. that. I figure e either either that was clear as mud, or I'm not quite sure what to make. Looks like you've no. got a customer. Yes. Good. Okay. I have one question. Um, um, the one of the things you were talking about when the, um, what is it? You were talking about the mother conferring the rights of personhood. The, the person you were talking about, I think you said that, they said it's not just the mother, it's also the other thing, the other people, the other people yeah. in, in the social. Um, I guess one question that arose in my mind, if, you know, if someone wants to take that view, which I don't, um, it seems to me that that's inherently um, fragile already because if it's just the mother, um, that's not enough. But you have to have the mother and the other culture around. And, well, how many is enough? And, a, yeah. and, and so how do they, do they even address that issue? Well, that's a, it's, it's, that's a really good question. Um, essentially, I think... Lindemann would say, and I'm, uh, I'm always reluctant to put words in somebody's mouth that I'm not quoting, but I think my best sense of what she would say on this is that it's, it's, it's much more than just the mother, but the mother is really the trump card. Uh, that it's, it's family members, it's extended family, it's community, um, and it's, it's even people. You know, there's the strangers that will care for children, sort of the, the, the village that will raise a child. Um, but where, where the, you know, in reality, if the mother doesn't confer significance, it's over, right? By, I mean, if she, if she chooses to end the pregnancy, she has not conferred significance, and everybody else in the social constellation is irrelevant to that. So I think in reality... Given what I know to be her view on ending pregnancies, she would have to say that it, the, the, the place that it stops with the mother, and, I, and in reality, she's the, the only one that matters on this. I think she's trying to put this in as broad a context as possible. But at the end of the day, if the mother decides, I I'm out of the pregnancy, then the fetus has nothing in terms of the conferral of personhood. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, so I had in, in high school, I had an AP environmental science teacher. And she said that she thinks the purpose of human life is to preserve Earth for the next generation. And so I guess her view of morality wouldn't necessarily be selfish. So I guess my question would be, how would you respond to that? Because I couldn't think of an answer. Yeah, I mean, I, th I actually think that's a fairly worthy goal, right? I think we'd all agree with that, right? I, I, I mean, I, would, I certainly don't think there's any support in, you know, in anything, although 
you know, Christianity has actually been accused of promoting a rape and pillage attitude toward the environment, which I, th I think is a misconception. Lynn, Lynn White, who wrote about that in the late 1960s, uh, that has become, I think, the conventional wisdom uh, among environmental scientists uh, who, who are not followers of Jesus, that Christianity has largely been at fault for the state of the environment today. Uh, I remember when I, was, when I was a doctoral student, I was explain, explaining to this that the Genesis account of creation actually is one of stewardship over creation, that the dominion mandate is not a, a, a freedom to rape and pillage the environment strictly for the benefit of human beings, but it, it carried a stewardship responsibility where, where human beings are trustees over the environment. Most of my doctoral colleagues that did not come from a Christian tradition, that was breaking news to them at the time. And so I think, I think that's, that's a worthy goal. Uh, although I, I would suggest, the way I would answer that is that there, there are valid human needs uh, that, that have to be balanced with environmental preservation. So I take, take for, for example, uh, I think the recent discussion on climate change I think is a, is a really good example of this. Uh, you know, I, li I live in California. And my, my state actually takes great pride in being on sort of the leading vanguard of movements to accelerate the progress toward reducing our carbon footprint. Uh, in, in my view, and we, we, there's probably considerable debate on this, but in my, in my view, taking pretty what I would call e economically draconian solutions for that. And I, I, have, I have no doubt that we are heading toward an, a, an era in where, you know, we will probably be majority, if not entirely, fueled by renewable energy. H how far away that is, is anybody's guess. How far away it should be, I think, is a matter of really significant moral debate. Because if, if the launch ramp to renewable energy is fairly short, like, like my state of California is proposing, what that will do to energy prices and to the ability of the poor to raise themselves out of poverty in the developing world in the short term, in my view, is catastrophic. Because the, the, the one thing besides education that is necessary for the poorest of the poor, and these are the people who live on, you know, 2 to $3 a day, in the developing world, to raise themselves out of poverty is cheap, plentiful energy. And so, I think that there's, there's a moral consideration here that I think needs to, be, needs to come into the equation, and that I would argue for a longer launch ramp to get to renewable energy so that the people who I think, we, who I think have the, the strongest claim on any, on any public policy, which are those who, are, who would be the most adversely affected, which are the poorest of the poor around the world. Uh, so that they, I mean, if, in my view, if we, if we go too fast toward renewable energy, we will cripple their ability to raise themselves out of poverty. So I was, that's an example where I think with, with our our consideration for the environment, we do have, comp there are competing moral obligations that we have, and sometimes, sometimes they need to be weighted differently, I think depending on what else is at stake. So I guess I would answer your prof by suggesting that there are, there are other moral considerations that have to be taken into account that I think are legitimate competitors um, with protection of the environment. Thank you. Yeah. Did it answer your question? Okay. okay. Uh, I'd like to ask, uh, where do animals and animal behaviors fit into a theistic moral world worldview in that, for example, a female praying mantis will decapitate the male after mating, or ducks primarily mate through rape, or a meerkat will uh, kill the kits of other pregnant mothers to avoid competition? Uh, are these actions morally abhorrent by using a human standard or through God's eyes, or do animals have their own moral order? 
Let me, let me, let me, let me fr- frame, it's a really good question. Let me frame it theologically. Um, and let me, let me I'll, just, I'll use it as an example the re- relationship in the Scripture between predator and prey. Okay. In, in Genesis 1 and 2, prior to the general entrance of sin into the world, there was no such thing as predator and prey. Okay. Uh, in fact, I think you can make a really good argument that in Genesis 1 and 2, human beings were intended to be vegetarians. Uh, and I... This, uh, I'll just, I'll just throw this out, but I think there's, there, there, may, there may be, it may be the case that when, when the Lord returns and the kingdom comes in its fullness, we may return to being vegetarians. Easy. Don't, don't, don't go, you know, don't go cardiac on me here. Um, now, the reason for that is when the, when the prophets talk about the kingdom coming in its fullness, they use some pretty vivid imageries about peace that will exist in the, in, in the animal community, that the, the lion will ride down with the lamb, so on, things like that. So I, what, I, what I take that to mean is that the relationship between, there, between predator and prey will no longer be on the table for discussion, not to mention for food. Uh, now, I think that, that being said, I think in, in the in-between time, while the world is living under the curse of sin, granted, you know, redemption has begun, but it's not finished, uh, there, we, may, we, we maintain this relationship between predator and prey. In fact, it's, it's, bec- it's become a part of how God sort of providentially provides for some of His creation. So, it's, so I would say, you know, eating meat is not necessarily a bad thing, though I do think that that vegetarianism could be seen as what I would call a kingdom foretaste um, in the future. Um, so some of you, some of you, I think, are cheering that. I'll <laughs> talk. To, I'll talk to you later. Uh, so, so that I would not say that the the animal kingdom has its own separate moral code, but I do think that some of the practices, like you describe, are the result of the animal kingdom being under the general curse of sin. And then, though, and I, I take it those things will no longer exist when the kingdom comes in its fullness and redemption is complete. Did that answer your question? Uh, yes, thank okay. you. I was wondering the young man's statement over here. Um, when these extremely intelligent people at Purdue walk around and see all these buildings that have been made, they don't look at the building and say how awesome they are, and that they. they they look at the architecture. It's like the man who goes down to the river and says, I can worship God fishing. Or the man who goes and gets into the deer stand and says, I worship God there. He may not be worshiping God. He may be worshiping the creation. Now, my question is, if we are worshiping God, wouldn't we care more for the creation and, and not just see the painting, but the artist behind the painting? Uh, yeah. No, I think, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, this, I'm, I'm sensitive to this because I, I have three kids who are all artists. Um, now, and they are making a living, <laughs> by the way. Just, just, I knew some of you had snarky comments that were coming. So, um, but, yeah, I, I mean, I do. I, I mean, I think, I think there, there, there is a, there's a sense of beauty in the natural world as, you know, as sort of, as as God originally designed it, um, that certainly is worthy of our recognition of the God who is behind it. Psalm 19, I think, is very clear about, about that. Uh, and and I think it, it, the Genesis account makes it really clear that contrary to uh, p- popular ideology in the ancient world, that there's a a, a distinction between the create the, that between the creation and the creator. And that the creator, not the creation, is what's to be worshipped. Uh, and I think m- most ancient idolatry that the Genesis account spoke out against were idolatries of the worship of the creation. That's why the gods of the ancient world were, were essentially creation gods. 
Um, so that Baal, for example, was the god of agriculture and fertility. Um, and that there, there were, and, and those, were, those were connected. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, would, I think there's, there's merit in recognizing the, the creator of beauty for, you know, for, for what, what and who he is. Now, I will say, uh, to be, I think to be clear, bibli- biblically, the, the picture of the eternal state when the kingdom comes in its fullness actually is not the wilderness. It's not sort of the natural creation. It's the city. You know, it's, the, the, it's, it's not the heavenly garden or the heavenly wilderness. It's the heavenly city, which suggests uh, something <clears throat> a little different. It suggests development, suggests commerce, uh, you know, it suggests, you know, trade and exchange and a medium of exchange and money and things like that. It just will be free from sin and corruption. So I want, I'd, want to, I'd want to be careful to, to hold, hold those two, I think, somewhat in balance because I think the Scripture affirms both of those uh, in, in really meaningful ways. Well, what I was saying was that we're creative because we're created. And yes, and we're, yeah, by, by a creative God. And listen, my, my boys who are artists, don't I know that? Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you for being here. Um, so you argued briefly uh, that there is a race absolutist ideology in our society on topics such as race, gender, um, sexuality, identity, diversity, and inclusion. Yes. Uh, could you further elaborate on that? And then also, could this possibly... Um, tie back to the whole concept of conference that you mentioned earlier. I think, I think a little harder about that second one. That second, that's a really good question on the mm-hmm. second one. I, I, this is strictly off the top of my head. I, never, I haven't thought about that part. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure I see, I'm not sure I see much of that. I think that's, um, uh, Maybe, maybe I'd say that's recognized mm-hmm. and not, not so much conferred. Um, but I think, you know, for, for example, I think uh, the, the, I'd say the, I'd, I'd say the, the, the place in culture that, uh, that the discussion of race has taken, I think is largely a good thing. Because I, I think for particularly in, in Christian circles, the church has had their head in the sand about race for a really long time. Uh, and so I think coming responsibly into that discussion, I think, is, is just is not negotiable. What I meant by the comment may, may be better illustrated by some of the, some of the things about sexuality. Uh, because, and I'll use my own institution as an example of this. Uh, I teach in a Christian college in California, uh, and we have a stand on marriage and sexuality, and it's public. Uh, we don't apologize for it. Um, and we have a target on our back from the, by, when the, and the California legislature is the one who's, who's looking at, at the gun sites through us at the target on our back. Uh, and we have, lo- there are lots of organizations in California who want to see Biola University go out of business. And there's no, there's, there's no real talk of uh, tolerance, no real, no real talk of religious freedom, of academic freedom, of diversity of views, uh, things like that. It's just, you know, we, we have a different view, and therefore, we've got a whole host of people who are trying to put us out of business. That's what I mean by a more, I have a more rigid absolutism about this. Um, so that if... if if, if for some reason you, you say the wrong thing about race or gender or sexuality, uh, I mean, people have their careers ruined for that. Uh, and there's, I, I, so I think the, that's, that's my point. I think the application of it, I think, is much, is much more absolutist than it used to be. Right? Now, I think, I think some, of, some of what we, you know, obviously... We have to be more inclusive, and I think we we have to recognize 
that uh, particularly those of us who name the name of Jesus have to be at the, at the front edge of reconciliation. Uh, and I think sometimes we forget that the early church dealt with the mother of all racial conflicts between Jews and Gentiles and considered their theology of the cross and their unity in Christ to be sort of end, end of story for the, you know, for, the, for the reasons necessary to pursue what was a very difficult reconciliation project. But the writers of the New Testament expect, not only encouraged, they expected the church to get it right. And remember there in Acts 15, Paul publicly rebuked Peter for his inability to, to treat Gentiles as co-heirs in Christ. And that was, fun, that was fundamentally an ethnic division. Uh, and they, you know, there, there just was the, there was the expectation that the church would do this well. And I think probably there are probably a handful of things that uh, I think our Lord is most disappointed in, and I suspect that that's, you know, how, how I think the church has failed in that area is, is one of those major, major disappointments to our God. Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, hello. Um, I just had a, I guess this is more of a question relating uh, morality, what, uh, more naturalism. So as much as we can talk about uh, relating morality with uh, theism, uh, isn't, is this a fair argument for, uh, I guess, uh, people who have a naturalistic view? Is that can't morals be forced, can't a group force their morals onto another group uh, for the survival of that one group? Let me take the first part of that, and then I'll, we'll go back and forth a bit on the second. Um, yeah, the, the answer to the first part of your question is yes, they can. It happens every day when a law is passed. I mean, this is why, this is why it's, 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 it just drives me nuts when people say, it's, you, know, you religious people have got to stop imposing your, your morality on everybody. I say, excuse me? You know, don't you wreck? Let's get over this silly notion that it's only religious people who are doing that. Because every law is the imposition of somebody's morality. Right? I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm open to there's certain, there being certain laws that might be morally neutral, but there's only a handful. I mean, I mentioned traffic laws earlier. Those presume respect for life and property. Uh, I mean, almost every law has a, has a moral overtone to it. And it's the imposition of someone's morality. Um, and, and, you know, I think they're, they're, I guess I would suggest that the imposition of morality is sort of an equal opportunity ideological offender. That happens across, across the ideological divide. Uh, now, enforcing morality for the, for the survival of the group, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Um, so give, give me an example. Uh, um, so let's see. Um, well, um, let's say that there there is one culture uh, that, or one group of people that ha that has uh, the morality of like hard work is really good, like they really value that. And then there's the other group who, well, they they value they don't really value in the sense of working hard that much. But and since that culture, they I say more like maybe they're like the like they encompass every they encompass like I guess the, they're like the majority. Let's just say they're the majority within like a group of people. But they're they're a group and there's another group. They live simultaneously in one. And let's say that the majority group they can uh, and they they make they let's say like they enforce the I guess the system in the sense of the way where it only works for people. Who uh, who work hard, and but the other group, they don't really value that. And so, in a sense, it I, I doesn't see. really benefit them, but it benefits the other group. And it. I, I see. Um, well, I th I think we what we what we generally do is that we we enforce this by the law, in in some respects, right. Uh, and we enforce, we enforce aspects of the law primarily to, pro, to, pro, uh, to protect order 
and promote justice uh, and basically to prevent all hell from breaking loose. I mean, that's basically why we enforce the law. Now, my, my own, I, I've got, there, there are different views of the law that I recognize. Um, so, but, and, but my, my view of the law kind of presumes a little darker view of human nature that comes from my adherence to the, you know, one of my, my patron saints is St. Saint Augustine, uh, who had, a, I think, a particular, some would call dark, I would say just realistic view of human nature. Now, the other way this can be enforced is through systems where, you know, it, it, where certain things can be incentivized. Like, for example, we, in, we incentivize people to own their own home by the tax laws. We incentivize people to be married through tax benefits that come from marriage. We encourage, we incentivize people to have children through child tax credits, you know, things like that. Although, you know, if you parents, if you put the if you put the pencil to that, uh, there's anyway you you get you get the picture. Uh, so some things I think some things we we intentionally build into the system. I think other things that, you, that I think that you mentioned about hard work, uh, I think those are, those I would call baked into the system maybe a little differently. Because um, I think, you know, for example, I think some of, the, some of the laws of economics that we've discovered, they just, they, they just are. Uh, I mean, you know, I I incentives matter to people. I mean, it sort of is what it is. Um, and so we, we function in light of those things. Now, some of those things, I think, are, um, you know, are there by, you know, by God's design. Um, others, I think, are, are mere human creations. So, for example, I would, I would say, this may be some debate about this, but I think our, our, our more largely market economic system is a human creation. I don't, I don't think, I mean, I I'm, I'm, I'm for most market kinds of things, but I don't think that was handed down from on high, from heaven. Uh, and God says, you know, thou shalt run your economy according to free markets. Uh, you know, markets are a human creation, and how well they function depends on the, what the participants in the system are like. Uh, this is why, for example, in my view, uh, when, we, when markets were introduced into the former Soviet Union, after the Berlin Wall fell years ago, uh, the economy, you know, in large part, was taken over by the Russian mob because the virtues necessary for markets to function effectively, just, just there, there, there had not been fertile soil for those to take root in. So, anyway, I hope that's answering your question. Uh, uh, I'll take that as a no. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Maybe let's, let's talk a little afterwards. Definitely. Okay. My question picks up on your analogy of a flower that's been cut on the stem, and we still expect it to keep flowering. Um, I would say our current Western culture is like that, and in that we largely rejected God. But my question to you is, based on my theory, is that the only thing keeping order at this point is our affluence. And if for some reason that was taken away, then we would degrade into disorder and uh, the social order would be broken. So can you, do you agree with that assessment? And tell me why. Well, you're asking me to play prophet on that. Um, yeah, I, I do, I, I, think there's, I think there's merit in the, the, the premise that um, our sense of order is largely held together by our affluence. I think that's a big part of it. I don't think that's all of it. I do think that we still have a very fairly deep reservoir of values that would that I think would stay intact if our affluence were diminished. Um, now it depends on the degree. I mean, if 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 it, say if we became much like uh, some of the states of Western Europe and Scandinavia, um, where the you know the, the tax rates are much much higher. There, seem, there just seems to be a different, there's a different trade-off where they pay higher taxes in exchange for much more services. And, um, but I think in general, the standard of living we would consider to be, you know, the, the GDP I think is less than what it would be here. Uh, if it, you know, if markets collapsed, and, you know, although watch, looking at the stock market today, I'm hopeful that that's not imminent. 
because uh, it was it was a very bad day for our 401ks today. Uh, but if you know if it you know if if for some reason we started to look like the developing world, uh, then I think you might have a point uh, where you know where uh, our, our common morality might look different. Uh, if if we're really struggling to sort of eke out a living, um, and I think maybe if it in, to, to, I think to maybe to to amplify that a bit, if, if also if the structure if the social structures that support our economic growth started to disintegrate, then I think it's it's not hard to see you know us reverting back to the, the the Hobbesian worldview of this you know, nasty life being nasty brutish in short. Thank you. Uh -huh. Well, let's at least take one more question so we don't close on that optimistic note. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, when you were talking about the naturalistic um, ex viewpoints of, you know, morality or rationality and different things, you gave different examples of kind of some inconsistency of the people that, um, that proposed those ideas of, you know, each of them kind of had a limit to where they were willing to um, stick to their naturalistic worldview. Um, and I was just wondering... In the day and age we live in, you know, there's a lot of, when we talk about these moral issues and different things, we run into a lot of people that maybe have some cognitive dissonance with those kind of things or maybe some intellectual dishonesty. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, how, how should we have that conversation with those people? How, how do you engage with people where that becomes, an, um, to where that, become, that plays a factor or that plays a role in the discussion? Um, and at one point, do you just kind of abandon philosophical or moral, you know, arguments in those discussions? Well, I, you know, being an academic, I'm not generally in favor of ever abandoning those. Uh, but I, I do realize that um, that if if you have people who oppose your views and and do so with a lot of passion. Uh, and they bring that to the discussion. Um, what, what I'm what, what I'm after is, you know, I want to I want to win over a person who I, who has become my friend. Mm -hmm. And I, f I find, and this is what I find so troubling about our current sort of political environment, is we seem content to to shell the other person who we disagree with and expect that somehow that's going to be a winning proposition. Um, you know, I'll take, take for example, I was, was at the American Enterprise Institute yesterday in D.C., and the, the president of the, of the institute described an episode where he had written a book. Uh, I forget what the book was about, but he had had a, a, a really harsh critic write him an email that would just went on. It took him like 15 minutes to read it went on and on and on about how, um, how he disagreed, thought he was an idiot, and just went point by point by point. And rather than come back at him with the same level of vitriol, instead, you know, you know how he approached it? He said, I said, you obviously took my work really seriously, and you read it all. I am so grateful that you read my whole book. And, and took it so seriously. And his email and he hit send. Um, and the next email he got back from the guy about 30 minutes later said, next time you're in my town, call me. I'd like to take you out to lunch. And there's something, I think there's something to the, the proverb that says, that says uh, you know, a, g a gentle answer turns away wrath. There's wisdom in that. Uh, we, we seem to think that the, the only way we can kind of get along today is by lobbing grenades at each other. Uh, you know, all, that, all that's doing is producing broken bodies. Now, to be, to be a little more specific, I do think that it's appropriate to gently point out the cognitive dissonance that they feel because... I think it's a, in, in my view, it's a, it's a little bit disingenuous 
to think that we, ha- we ought to have this full flower that's been cut off from its roots. And the way, I, the way I would do this is by creating scenarios that I know will illustrate that dissonance for them and just say, so tell me, tell me, I'm, and, and, and without, you know, without doing this like it, it's in your face, but to say, you know, I'm really interested to, to understand, help me understand how you think about a scenario like this. Mm-hmm. Says I, because I think our, our, our first response with people who disagree with us passionately is to listen. We, we, we have, in my view, we have culturally almost lost the ability to listen to people who disagree with us. And I think that's part, that's part of what the Bible calls us to treat people, even people who disagree passionately, but treat them with respect and dignity. Um, and to usually what we find is that, that expression of gratitude, you know, I'm so glad you read my book, thank you can be incredibly disarming. Okay? Now, I realize there are some people, you know, who are going to be angry and vitriolic, and no amount of winsomeness is going to change that. I get that. Uh, but that doesn't give us a pass to launch a hand grenade back. Right? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. You're going to cut this off, aren't you? I'm the bad guy. Yes. How dare you? Yes. So in the interest of time, we're going to end our formal Q&A here. Uh, let's go ahead and give Can one I? more round of applause for Dr. Ray. Can, can now, I ask? I, I, need, I need to do one thing before we stop. Sure. I want to ask a favor. This isn't on the script. This is not on the script. So this is my, it's my son's birthday today. When I say go, would you yell happy birthday to him? Okay, I'll give you the three, two, one, just a minute. Please pick up. Please pick up. Austin, just say happy birthday, Austin. <sighs> Voicemail. Happy birthday, Austin! (laughs) Who loves you, baby? All right. Thank you very much. You guys who are at the mics, uh, Dr. Ray has has offered to stick around and and talk with you a little later, so you guys get first dibs. Um, I want to thank you for your participation tonight. And uh, two quick things before you leave. First of all, this is just the beginning of this weekend symposium. If you look in your brochures, which you hopefully got at the front door as you're coming in, you'll see that we have a dozen talks tomorrow between plenaries and breakout sessions. Like tonight, all events are free and open to the public, so please invite your friends. Lastly, you'll be able to go back and watch Dr. Ray's talk, as well as previous symposium talks all the way back to 2011 on our website at symposiachristi.net. So go out with others tonight and have great discussions about do you matter, says who. Thank you. Good night.